Welcome to worship during this time after Pentecost. On Pentecost, the last of the 50 days of Easter, we celebrated the first century church's baptism by the Holy Spirit and the continuing new life and faith given to us by the Spirit today. In the time after Pentecost, worship focuses our life as church together and church in the world. We'll open in prayer today with a prayer of the people. So when I say, Lord, in your mercy, you're invited to respond. Hear our prayer. Uplifted by the power of the Holy Spirit, we join with people of faith in all times and places in praying for the church, the world, and all who are in need. God of compassion, you have opened the way for us and brought us to yourself. Pour your love into our hearts that overflowing with joy, we may freely share the blessings of your realm and faithfully proclaim the good news of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of the whole world, you call all people of the world your children, and you come near to us in our distress. Especially today, we pray for hope and healing for Kari, Ethel, Doug, Mary Ann, and those we name before you now. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the consolation of family and friends of those who have died, Lehman Hogue, and those we name before you now. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of all that is holy, we have created divisions you will not own. In places of conflict, raise up leaders who work to develop lasting peace and reconciliation. Encourage organizations and individuals who care for all, forced to leave their homes. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of grace, you provide a plentiful harvest of gifts and resources. Prepare us to labor and gather the fruits of this congregation that we might discover new ways of living. Minister to us in our work that we do not lose heart. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Receive these prayers, O God, and those prayers on our hearts too deep for words. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen. A reading from Romans chapter 5. Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand. And we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. Indeed, rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person someone might actually dare to die. But God proves his love for us in that while we still were sinners, Christ died for us. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We are God's people and the sheep of God's pasture. We are God's people and the sheep. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into God's presence with a song. Know that the Lord is God, our maker to whom we belong. We are God's people and the sheep of God's pasture. We are God's people and the 
the gates of the Lord with thanksgiving and the courts with praise. Give thanks and bless God's holy name. Good indeed is the Lord whose steadfast love is everlasting, whose faithfulness endures from age to age. We are God's people. This is the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Then Jesus summoned the 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out, to cure every disease and every sickness. These are the names of the 12 apostles. First, Simon, also known as Peter, and his brother Andrew, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon the Cananean, and Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him. These 12 Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, proclaim the good news. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. You received without payment. Give without payment. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. I know enough to be dangerous. This is something people say when they don't know much about a topic, but they think they have a gem that they want to throw in the mix. I am that way with art. A few trips through the museums, and suddenly I feel free to wax rhapsodic on Degas and Da Vinci. Whatever my failings in knowledge, though, I make up for an enthusiasm. There are times when you look at a masterpiece and the effect is transcendent. For a moment, your eye is captured and your soul is filled with something other. Beauty has that effect. Closer to the ground, we're cresting into late spring. Aspirations of green thumbs abound across many a beating heart while some blooms begin to fade and hardier ones take their place. Last week, it was the pale pink peonies that frothed in a profusion of petals. 2020 is a perfect year for the peony. The right amount of sun and water fell and the hail didn't. And after my usual hemming and hawing about leaving them outside or bringing them in, I clipped a bouquet and have been enjoying them for over a week. I posted a picture of them on the social media, attempting some poetry about air for the soul. Again, I know enough to be dangerous. The thing about beauty is that it reminds us that our humanity is part of something, something both essential and transcendent. For me, this is especially necessary when times are difficult when everyone seems to know enough to be dangerous, and when suffering seems inescapable. Suffering is a universal human experience. There was plenty of it in my early kid years when my family was blown apart by mental illness and domestic violence, and more during my years as a pediatric oncology nurse, 
and more over time as a pastor. Here's one of the things I know about suffering from all those years. Suffering cannot be compared. It's a lot like beauty that way. What's more beautiful? Degas' ele elegant scripture of La Petite Danseuse or the riotous tumble of pink peonies? It's a ridiculous question. Suffering is similar to beauty in that way. Being with someone who is suffering for any reason is not a time to get into qualifying their experience, giving a different take on it, or redirecting them to someone else's experience of suffering. That stuff is the opposite of helpful. Being with someone who is suffering is a time to listen and to wonder. It's a time to share their burden by holding space for it without rushing to comfort. Sharing the burden lightens the suffering without imagining that it can be taken away. Suffering is something the Apostle Paul seems to understand. How often do you suppose he cried out to God without a pen in hand? It must have been a lot. It must have been a lot given his turn from the one giving punishment to the one on the receiving end of being beaten, stoned, and imprisoned. For him, for Paul, to write about suffering like that, he knew it intimately, like a friend, just like he knew God. Listen again to a few of the verses from his letter to the Roman church. Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace through God, through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand, and we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance. And endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint us, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. The Apostle Paul is talking about all of us. One reason his words about suffering resonate so strongly is because he describes what he knows and what we know. And he knows way more than enough to be dangerous. He knows enough to be comforting. Comfort is no small thing. It is not appeasement, meaning I am not making you feel better so that I feel better. Comfort is deep knowing shared across our human experience. Most of us have experienced suffering, and still we live on. Some of us not so elegantly, but still we live. Paul's account of moving from suffering to endurance to character to hope is a description. It is not a strategy. He describes what we know by faith and experience about how suffering works. There are days in the midst of suffering that we wonder how it's possible to make it through. Days in which we're not sure who we are anymore. And then in the body of Christ, the church, we're reminded again of the main things. God's promises to us no matter what is happening. For our congregation, one such moment was Matthias' baptism in the last couple weeks. It had long been on the worship calendar, and his baptism on Pentecost couldn't have been more perfectly timed. Masks and quiet sanctuary notwithstanding, water flowed off Matthias' head in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. We prayed for the spirit of wisdom, understanding, knowledge, and joy. And he was sealed by the Holy Spirit and marked with the cross of Christ forever. In baptism, God promises to be present, 
to form us as disciples to always take us back and to be the eternal one in our lives every day. In baptism, we have obtained access to this grace on which we stand. We were buried with Christ in baptism so that we too might live in newness of life. Today, right now, even in the midst of suffering, we are pulled through the cross of Christ. The cross frames suffering in a different way. The cross promises the presence of God in our suffering. We know that Jesus' body broke and died, which means that God knows suffering and God suffers with us. God's alignment with our suffering promises endurance through to hope. And hope does not come at the expense of false optimism where we close our eyes and wish everything away. False optimism is knowing enough about hope to be dangerous. Rather, hope comes from being planted at the foot of the cross while awaiting new life and continuing to do the hard work of grieving and the hard work of reconciliation with each other. Simply put, the cross binds us to the hard work of love in the midst of suffering. Loving God, loving neighbors, and loving ourselves in such a time as this. By our baptism, our gracious Heavenly Father frees us into hope and forms us into instruments of cross and resurrection in the name of the one who is, who was, and who is to come, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen, and thanks be to God. And now receive this blessing. Neither life, nor death, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will separate you from the love of Christ Jesus our Lord. God is with you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit forever and always and today. Amen.
trumpet shall sound.